Well, I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is um, I'm seeing a lot of the people I know registered. Um, and while we wait for a couple others, I'm going to go ahead and start my um, intro for the session. And by that time, we'll, we may have others who have joined us um, and I'll let those guys in. But um, in the interest of time, I'll get going. And uh, so, first of all, um, good afternoon and welcome to um, our brand new um, Out Alaska Outdoor Alliance Lunch and Learn series. Um, Alaska's Outdoor Alliance provides the big tent under which stakeholders in our state's $3.2 billion outdoor recreation sector come together to share viewpoints, solve problems, and advocate for measures like the one we'll discuss today um, with the goal of ensuring Alaska enjoys the best outdoor recreation economy in the world. Um, we represent the interests of motorized and non-motorized summer and winter sports enthusiasts, um, retailers, manufacturers, public land managers, and allied business, transportation, health, and conservation groups. Today's session will be recorded. Um, links to a greatest hits highlights reel from all our Lunch and Learn series will be shared in upcoming AOA News Blasts. So if you haven't already, be sure to sign up for the newsletter at the AOA website and invite your coworkers and friends to visit Alaska. Um, OutdoorAlliance.org to help grow the base of Alaskans who see a future for the last frontier that recognizes the economic and health benefits of a thriving, sustainable outdoor recreation sector. My name is Lee Hart, um, and I am the founder and executive director of this relatively new nonprofit. Um, and today, I am thrilled to introduce you to our Lunch and Learn series hosts from the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Um, the, Teddy Ro the TRCP, um, as those of us, uh, another new acronym, um, is uh, the mission of that group is to guarantee that all Americans have quality places to hunt and fish. And in order to accomplish their goals, they collaborate with nonprofits, businesses, donors, lawmakers, and sportsmen and sportswomen um, to work toward those goals. Um, the people we have with us this, this afternoon include um, our brand new Alaska field representative, Jen Leahy, who, bring, Leahy, who brings 15 years of experience supporting fish and wildlife conservation to, the, to TRCP. Her love of adventure and salmon fishing eventually led her from the Pacific Northwest to Alaska, where she spent several seasons working as a wilderness tour guide before planting her roots in the coastal community of, of Seward. Prior to joining TRCP in January 2020, Leahy served as the communications director at the Seward Chamber of Commerce, where she brought fresh perspectives to her work in sustainable tourism and rural economic development. Previously, she worked with fishing interests to reduce the bycatch of valuable species like Chinook salmon and halibut in Alaska's federal fisheries. She holds a bachelor's degree from Washington State University with an emphasis in political science and sustainable, and sustainable development. And in her free time, you'll find her foraging, fishing, and hunting across Alaska's legendary public lands and waters. Then joining Len um, is Joel Webster, the senior director of Western programs for TRCP. He joined TRCP in 2007 and spent much of the past 15 years working alongside hunting and fishing groups, wildlife managers, decision makers, and agency leaders to shape federal public policy, federal public lands management, to shape federal, sorry, to shape federal public lands management for the benefit of fish, wildlife, and sportsmen. He was born in the West and is committed to hunter-angler issues and has um, been since since he was old enough to carry a rifle. During his time with TRCP, he has been intimately involved in the development of Idaho and Colorado roadless rules and the creation of the 2012 National Forest Planning Rule. He also works alongside the TRCP Western team to balance public land, energy development, and other resources, safeguard big game migration corridors, expand public access, and conserve unfragmented fish and wildlife habitat on public lands managed by the BLM and U.S. Forest Service. Joel lives in Missoula, Montana, where he earned a Master's of Environmental Studies at the University of Montana. Um, with that, um, and allowing me to admit a few more people to our group, I will turn it over to 
Jen to begin our conversation today. Great. Thanks so much for that introduction, Lee. Does the audio seem to be working okay? It sounds fabulous. Awesome. Um, well, thanks everyone for your interest in Mapland. Joel and I are really excited to be here and to talk with you today. It looks like uh, when I just checked, we had maybe about 10 people or so in the group. And I'd, I'd really like if, um, is there a chat option that's open right now, Lee? Yeah, you can, uh, you can uh, ping in on the chat. It, just click your chat box at the bottom of the screen and you can, they can respond to whatever you're going to ask them. Great. Um, so I think it'd be fun to hear how people use our public lands um, and have a sense of that as we're walking through the presentation. So if you hunt, fish, or trap, we'd love to hear that. But the legislation that we're going to be talking about has um, potential impacts for folks who like to recreate in all different ways. And so if you're primarily a mountain biker or a sea kayaker or a hiker, um, just go ahead and drop in the chat the thing that you probably spend the most time um, out there doing when you're recreating on our public lands, and that'll help give us a sense of where the group is at today. And that would be awesome. And also, uh, just in case folks like me who maybe hadn't spent as much time on Zoom, if you, uh, you can change how you prefer to see the uh, speakers in the corner. So if it's kind of distracting to have a bunch of extra videos and you're trying to read a slide, you can go up there and um, show a smaller speaker video or minimize that altogether and just check out the presentation. Okay. Let's see if I can, perfect. Great. So I was at an event a couple of days ago and I was wearing my TRCP hat and somebody came up to me and said, ah, totally rad, cool people. <laughs> I was like, what? And they said, TRCP, totally rad, cool people. And I love that because I think my colleagues are totally rad, cool people, although that's not technically our name. We're the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership and our name does tell you a lot about us. Uh, Roosevelt understood that safeguarding critical hunting and fishing habitat for future generations required uh, good planning now. And he was saying that, you know, over 100 years ago, and that's still true today. So we work primarily on federal land management issues uh, to improve public access and quality wildlife habitat. And we amplify the voices of sportswomen and sportsmen on issues that unite all of us. Uh, we also, like the Alaska Outdoor Alliance, understand that investments in conservation really support our robust uh, outdoor recreation economy that we have here in Alaska. And last spring, I joined Lee and a few others who might be on this call in Juneau, where we spoke with legislators about how our industry helps fuel Alaska's economy. Uh, our approach is nonpartisan, solution-oriented, and collaborative. And that really helps us maximize our effectiveness with the public um, elected officials and agency partners that we work with. Our team is about 40 people nationally. We've got a Center for Western Lands based in uh, Missoula, where Joel's at, as well as offices in D.C. and Denver. Um, and we have field staff in about nine Western states. Um, I'm the Alaska Field Representative I split my time between um, the Kenai Peninsula and the Matsu Valley, and uh, those are the traditional homelands of the Sigpiak and Dena'ina people, and I'm so grateful to have an opportunity to live, work, and play in these really incredible places. So although my position is new um, as a full-time role this year, the TRCP has been working on several issues in Alaska for a number of years. So uh, we're not new to Alaska, just that having boots on the ground here full time is new, which is also really exciting for us. Partnership is in our name and you can see that reflected here. Uh, nationally, we represent a diverse group of about 60 organizational partners from more traditional hunting and fishing groups like the Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants, Quail, um, uh, Mule Deer, Elk, all of those groups to um, the conservation and outdoor recreation leaders that you see here. And our corporate council includes nearly two dozen industry leaders, including some very familiar brands that you see here 
And all of these folks really understand how important conservation is to their bottom line. So we partner with all of them um, in different ways that they're all very um, valuable partners. And we have about 100,000 individual advocates. And at the end of our presentation, I'll show you how you can um, also join the TRCP if that's something you'd be interested in doing. So now that you know a little bit more about who we are and how we work nationally, I just want to touch really briefly on our role in Alaska and our approach to some of our work here. Um, one thing that sets us apart from some other sportsmen's groups operating in Alaska is that we typically don't engage on issues related to resource allocation or harvest methods. Um, some groups up here were founded specifically to advocate for specific user groups like resident hunters or guides, and there's definitely a role for that. Um, but we really focus on the issues that unite our community, like public access, healthy habitat, clean water, and adequate funding for conservation. So you typically won't see us weighing in on Board of Game or Board of Fish proposals, um, more state-specific issues, since we uh, focus primarily on federal land management issues. Um, some of the specific uh, campaigns and conservation issues that we've been working on in Alaska are um, to ensure that the voices of hunters and anglers are represented in the Alaska roadless rule um, rulemaking process, uh, BLM resource management plan in the Central Brooks Range, and we've also been involved with um, many others in the fight against pebble mine down in Bristol Bay. Um, and why this matters for this group is that I think as everybody here understands that our outdoor economy really relies on investments in conservation. Visitors from all over the world come to Alaska to experience our incredible wildlife and natural resources. And so public access and healthy habitat um, helps drive the economy that way. Funding for conservation projects is largely driven by the license fees and excise taxes paid by hunters and anglers and recreational shooters. So that's how our community um, fits into the mix. And the more opportunities that people have to participate in these activities, the more um, our fish and wildlife habitat will flourish along with the Alaskans who depend on these public resources. So with that little bit of background, we're going to turn it over to Joel, and he's going to give us an overview about how um, this map planned um, act came to be. Thank you, Jen, and thanks for the introduction, Lee. You always, it's a good reminder to always keep your bio updated on the website. Um, <laughs> so Sorry I'm gonna, that. No, you're good. Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Sounds okay. great, Jill. Oh, good. So I'm going to talk, um, you know, give an introduction on the Map Land Act and start a little bit with its origins. If you go to the next slide, please. So in 2018, we started working with Onyx Maps, and I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with Onyx. They were the company that created the SD card that went in Garmin GPSs that delineated property boundaries and roads and all that for the first time in GPS units. And, um, you know, since then, they have a really popular um, handheld smartphone application. And, you know, I live in the, the lower 48. Um, and so some of this is, you know, sort of focused on lower 48, but it, I think it's, we think it's applicable to Alaska as well um, in varying degrees. But basically what these technologies did is they helped the public understand how to access parcels of public land that maybe aren't easy to access, where there's property boundary issues that you've got, you've got to navigate. Um, but what they've also made the public aware of is that there's public lands out there that you can't get to. And so uh, a lot of people were talking about this issue about these landlocked public lands that require, you know, permission from a neighboring landowner in order to access. Found it to come this summer and found the 9.5 million acres in 13 of the western states in the, the lower 48 um, were landlocked and um, did not have access. We've subsequently um, we did a state report finding over six million acres, and we're currently looking actually at some eastern states. And 
I guarantee if we're finding some landlocked parcels in places like New Jersey, that there's some in Alaska too. It's probably not a huge issue, but they do exist. Um, but one of the things we found through this whole um, you know, project is that easement records, so um, the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, other agencies, they, they hold um, recorded access rights across properties owned by other entities um, that connect public roads to their lands. And for the most part, almost all of those easement records are held in on paper files still. They're they're in dusty filing offices. And as a result, the agencies do not even have a very good understanding of where they do and do not have access to their own lands. And and so that's something that really um, you know came to our attention through this process. And they also don't have the money right now, or at least not the priorities within the agency. It's not a priority um, to digitize these. And so the problem sort of sits there. Next slide, please. Joel, is that landlocked slide showing yeah, up? Yeah, it just showed. Thank you. Okay. And so here's an example um, of a landlocked parcel. And this is a state land parcel. It's not a federal one, but this is kind of the situation. And generally, you get around you know, more urban areas or places where there's a lot of, um, you know, just some sort of country sprawl around communities. Like you get, you get this type of, of land ownership pattern. Um, and here's just an example of a couple of, of parcels that have the red slash across them where um, there's just no roads that get to them or no trails. And those private parcels around them control access to those public lands. Next slide, please. Another issue that has come to our attention is there's a lot of information. There's a lot, so all the agencies have rules about recreation and access, and those are developed generally through land use plans or travel management plans, or potentially through like something that you know the federal agencies do. Also, the state agencies have these types of um, generally anyway these types of restrictions or rules. Um, but what we found is that that information, if it's in digital form, is oftentimes inconsistent. Is actually made in the digital form. Sometimes the attributes aren't very useful at the BLM, um, but it doesn't actually show whether or not the roads open to different types of vehicles, and so it's useless. Um, so there's things like that. That's it's. So it's oftentimes not in digital form. Um, it's inconsistently digitized. And, um, but the information is out there. It's generally in these plans. It's been made or it's in a filing cabinet. And so there's all this information about access, but the public really can't get it. And as a result, um, you know, increasingly busy Americans, A, have a hard time finding information about outdoor recreation because they have to, you know, sort of dig through volumes of environmental impact statements um, in order to find it. Or um, they're out recreating on their public lands and, are, and so they may or may not be actually sort of extra cautious and, and not do things like drive down a road because you do not know whether or not it's open. And so those are some of the consequences of not having that information. Next slide, please. Hey, Joel, I'll advance yeah. the slide, but um, you the video's coming through like a little bit glitchy and it's um, doing the same to the audio. Do you want to try and turn your video off and we'll see if the audio comes through a little better? Because the next slide's a goodie. Okay, it should be up on your end. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. All right, so to help address some of these issues, um, a bipartisan group of lawmakers introduced the MAP, the Modernizing Access to Our Public Land Act, also known as the MAP Land Act, in both the House and Senate. And what this legislation would do um, is it would provide $32.5 million over three years to 
the Department of the Interior, so all those agencies, the Park Service, the BLM, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Reclamation, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Army Corps of Engineers, um, and require that they standardize digital recreation information that they that's existing, that they make that they digitize that information, that they make it publicly available, specifically for um, federally held easements. Uh, across private land that provide access to those public lands, um, roads and trails. So roads and trails on those public lands, um, what they're open to, as well as any restrictions that exist. So those could be both permanent and temporal restrictions. So if you have a, a if you have a trail that, let's say, is open to dirt bikes but not four wheelers, like that would have to be. Um, that distinction would need to be included in the information as well as trails that are non-motorized and all that. And so everybody knows the rules, boundaries about shooting and hunting restrictions. So oftentimes you'll have areas that have shooting restrictions, but nobody knows really where the boundaries are um, as well as federally held waterways, any sort of watercraft or motorized restrictions that are controlled federal waters. And so a lot of waters are controlled by the state. So this wouldn't address all of them, but, Frequently, um, you'll have like lakes or, or other bodies of water on, um, you know, that are within federal lands that have, you know, federal restrictions. And this would make sure that all that information is made digital and then made publicly available. Next slide, please. And, and so this is something that, um, you know, has quite a bit of support. I know um, the hunting community nationally is you know unanimous, unanimously hunting and fishing community sort of you know behind this as well as the outdoor recreation community um here's several quotes from some outdoor rec companies we're currently working with the outdoor recreation roundtable as well on a letter and they um, represent all the different trade associations including the outdoor industry association they work with all those different ones across you know the the outdoor sector. And so we're working with them right now on a support letter as well. So um, yeah, here's, here's just a few examples. And hopefully this works, Jen, but we have a, a silly little animated video here that hopefully people don't walk around with smartphones in their hands like this all the time when they're outside, but it, it does lay out what the bill does. Yeah, Lee and I tested this yesterday. So I think instead of making it full screen, I'm going to keep it the size that it is. And I'm not sure if the audio is going to pick up from my own speaker. So I'll, I'll pick that up and we'll see how this goes. If it's glitchy, we can move on. Smartphones and handheld GPS devices have revolutionized how Americans enjoy the outdoors. These technologies pinpoint your location relative to property boundaries and other important landmarks, allowing all of us to enjoy outdoor opportunities in new ways. But these systems are only as good as the data that goes into them. Often, access information for our national forests, BLM lands, wildlife refuges, and national parks is only found on paper maps or in dusty filing cabinets. And much of the existing electronic information was produced for purposes other than recreation. Hunters, anglers, hikers, bikers, and other outdoor enthusiasts need modern and accurate digital information to fully enjoy our public lands and waters. A new bipartisan bill in Congress promises to make this happen. The Mapland Act directs our public land management agencies to standardize comprehensive digital mapping records and make them available to the recreating public. This includes which agency roads and trails are open to travel by car, off-highway vehicle, bicycle, horseback, or foot, and during what times of year, exact boundaries of shooting and hunting zones, portions of rivers and lakes on federal land with watercraft restrictions, and easement records showing which roads can be used to cross into public lands. The availability of this data would reduce conflicts with private landowners. Plus, public lands belong to all of us. This would empower Americans to take advantage of more outdoor opportunities on our public lands, including some you never knew existed. Tell Congress to pass the Mapland Act by visiting trcp.org slash mapland. All right, video success. 
see if I can get past this. Those oh, smartphones and handheld GPS. De- okay. There we go. Okay. So Joel walked us through some of the basics about what this legislation does. And I'm going to talk a little bit now about what specifically this means for Alaskans and some of the implications of the legislation. So we are really fortunate here in Alaska that we have um, so much public land to enjoy. Federally managed public lands make up the majority of the total area in Alaska. I think it's about 222 million acres or so. Those are national forests, wildlife refuges, Um, national parks and preserves, BLM managed land. They manage more land than any other federal agency up here. And also things like the National Petroleum Reserve and military bases. So most of that federally managed land is publicly um, accessible for us. And as Joel's explaining and the video explains, part of the challenge is that agencies use different systems for Um, compiling the information that they share out. And so it's really inconsistent experience for public land users trying to figure out um, where they stand and what property boundaries are. And boundaries are really dynamic. And especially in the last 20 years, um, we've seen a lot of conveyances, um, which are, uh, it's a, you know, a process that is, we're still working through um, from statehood and the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act um, that the state and the native corporations that were created out of that act are owed certain lands and that process just takes a really long time for completing those conveyances. And so um, some folks are familiar with the difference between lands that have been allotted or selected versus conveyed. And those all have different um access opportunities. And so that's something that is kind of unique to Alaska that can make our make navigating public lands up here a little trickier because of course we're all trying to be responsible users and minimize um, conflicts and trespassing. And so even folks who are really making a, a diligent effort to understand um, where they can go, it can that can be an uphill battle with how Um, buried some of the easement records, for example, um, can be. In one case, when I was researching this presentation, because I ran through some different models, like, oh, what if I wanted to go do this on this lands? And, you know, it's jumping through a lot of hoops, visiting a lot of different websites to find that information. And one agency says on their website that, you know, if you want to understand, um, the best way to access the lands that you're trying to get to that what you really need to do is come on down to one of their offices and have, and someone will help you, you know, look up title documents and easement maps and conveyance records and receive in-person physical technical support in order to figure this stuff out. And I think especially right now with um, how difficult it is to gather um, that that's a really tall, even in non-pandemic times, that's a big ask of folks to drive down to an office. And we have the tools to digitize and standardize this information, but MapLand would help provide agencies with the resources and direction they need to um, take that uh, to the finish line. So also just to know that the, just as boundaries have changed in the past, they'll continue to change in their land management plans that are in the works that could potentially result in millions of additional acres um, in transfership uh, or in transferring ownership um, that could affect public access. And so the better information we have, um, the more we can all feel confident going out knowing that, um, that we know where we stand literally. One of the other things that is really helpful for Alaskans about this legislation is that um, MapLand would help link together the regulations for recreation on these federal public lands and the mapping data. So when I was looking up, um, say I want to go snow snow machining in the Chugach National Forest, or I want to understand snow machine regulations because maybe I want to go to a non-motorized use area, 
that requires sifting through a 26 page for service winter motorized order in order to do that. And what Mapland could do is help integrate some of that data. So if you were looking on your handheld GPS about um, looking at a, a trail or a, a patch of public land, you could also see the, oh, it's still close to motorized use because, you know, maybe there's not enough snowpack or this area. I know where, um, where I live part of the year in Seward, um, the Lost Lake area that's really popular for snow machining allows motorized use in alternating years. And so instead of having to be looking at your maps and then looking up the regs in different places, um, these things could be connected. If you want to find out where you can take an off-highway vehicle on BLM managed lands, you have to know exactly which travel plan um, that you need to be looking at. That information isn't standardized. If you want to know what um, the rules and regs are, if you want to go play in the Kenai Refuge, that's 12 pages of information to sort through and um, again, we know there are a lot of people acting in good faith and they're um, trying to be diligent before they go out. And I think we should be making those barriers easier to clear um, for folks so that we have more opportunity and fewer conflicts. The other way that Mapland would help Alaskans is that it would essentially supercharge some of these um, federal funds that we have coming into the state through the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Um, I think since the program's inception, Alaska has received about $150 million for public access projects. And recently, federal funding just got a real boost from the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act and the permanent reauthorization of LWCF, which is awesome. And so we know that I think this is a national figure, not a state figure, that at least $27 million, you know, must be spent annually to establish or improve access to public lands. And the portion of that that comes to Alaska, we want to make sure that we're prioritizing these projects effectively so the money is going where we really need it. So if we have a better understanding of where permanent access has already been secured, we'll have a better sense of where we want these future land acquisitions to be and, and what projects are needed. And that'll help inform our land managers make the best available use of those funds. And with all the folks that we have on the call and the different backgrounds and um, interests that everybody brings to the table, I'm curious to hear from folks what Mapland might mean from you. It could be something as um, as general as, you know, if I feel more confident and where I can go, that I'll get out more with my family and friends. Or maybe you're um, with a better understanding of the rules and regs, you'll finally take that big trip that you, you know, that crosses a patchwork of different types of public land or public and private land. Um, that, by the way, is uh, one of my favorite photos of Lee in the middle there from a recent trip that we did on, on Birch Creek. Had to fit her in here. And then uh, maybe it would also help you be more prepared or feel more prepared for a backcountry adventure. So I'm curious to hear from others. Feel free to unmute and um, chime in if there are ways that, based on what you've heard already, you think that this kind of legislation might help improve or enhance your um, recreation experiences here. Hello? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Oh, you might have lost that person. Lee, did you have anything that came to mind? Um, no, I'm just really, you know, one of the things, I guess it's a comment is one of the things I'm excited about is the, this, this slide, the, one of the, the slide here about, you know, the daylighting of, uh, the, the land, the allowable land uses, um, and, uh, you know, simplifying getting answers to those questions for the general public, again, no matter how you recreate, um, and, but where you're planning to go and knowing, you know, that you have, the ability to get there um, <clears throat> without getting yourself in trouble um, is, is I think a really great benefit of this program. Mm -hmm. So can anybody hear me now? 
Yes. Yep. yep. Go ahead, Michelle. Hi. Hi, Lee. Hi, Lee. Hi Jen. How you doing? Hi, Michelle. Um, I have a question for your $27 million that is to be spent annually. Uh, can that be used for trail grooming, like say through the Matsu Valley, through the borough or anything like money funding giving given to the borough hmm. and given to the club? This is Joel. I, that money specifically is for the purchase of interest in land. And so it could be the acquisition of fee title, like a actual parcel or for purchase of easements. I know that there's a, this, this is part of the land and water conservation fund. There is a state side portion to LWCF with matching grants. And I don't know how that would tie to grooming. I know that side of the, of the program's different, but for the 27 million, that's really a, Tied to federal land agencies. Okay, yeah, I got it. That's a good question. Conversation late, so I probably missed it when you covered that. No, oh, no worries. We're glad to have you with us. I was thinking about you as I was um, building this out because I don't know. I mean, Michelle, in your area, for those that don't know, Michelle um, leads up a organization that's based in, in near Petersville and um, advocating for snow machiners and does a lot of uh, trail work. Michelle, are there, are there any areas around where you live that there's been confusion around um, land boundaries and like what's public or private there? Uh, we had the majority of our trails surveyed. And if you go to uh, the Matsu Borough, you'll see where they actually have a trail program and a plan for all of the Matsu Borough for trails. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but I think it's something like Matsu Trails. <laughs> but anyway, um, we have the reason why we started the program was to get rid of the conflict that we had going across to other people's properties and and what is federal, what is borough, and what is state. And you actually have to get a uh, little piece of paper that tells you that you're going to be a steward of the. Uh, borough land in order to cross or groom their property or clear the brush or whatever you're you're assigned that trail mm -hmm. i hope that answers your question hey yeah. michelle i have a question for you so i know you had a recent case of some trespass or some property damage um do you think that having that the if the public had better maps do you think that that might um, help people understand where these boundaries are and might mitigate against um, those types of occurrences in the future yeah, we do have a map that is available to people, but I think that it could be improved tremendously. Uh, I think that a little bit more signage would help and wands and stuff like that so people don't get confused out there where they're going. Mm -hmm. Maps on the trail system as well. Yeah. Yeah, snow machiners can cover so much ground. And so I think, you know, that user group might be even more likely than some others to um, benefit from, you know, enhanced um, mapping um, and might also be good folks to keep an eye out for areas where they think there should be public access or where, and there's not. So whether an easement would be helpful or whether there's concerns that maybe a um, property owner is interpreting easements differently. I'll, at the end of the presentation, share a link that we have um, where property owners and public land users can all um, submit um, not just concerns, but opportunities um, to improve access and reduce conflicts. So everybody can kind of be eyes and ears when they're out there looking for places where um, easements, for example, would be helpful and enha enhance recreation opportunities. Thanks, Michelle. So, Jim, I have another this question. Is, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, on this map land, like I said, I got into the meeting late, and I apologize for that. But is this something, I, this may be a dumb question, but is this something that people could put on their phones and be able to look and say, okay, I, I'm here. You know, a lot of times on your phone, you you have a GPS reading on it. I'm not sure if I understand all of this. Mm -hmm. So I'll take a quick stab at that, and then Joel can maybe add a little bit more to that. But in a nutshell, 
Um, the, the bill would help give federal agencies the resources and direction they need to digitize and standardize some of the information that goes into GPS maps. And then what that interface looks like would depend on the, um, the app that you end up using. Um, Onyx is one that we referenced earlier and we partnered with them on some projects, but there are others. Or if you're super savvy, which I am not, um, some folks like to download that information directly and build their own maps or put it into their own um, systems. But we are, we're talking about mapping tools uh, that are specific to federal land management agencies. But the hope is that if we could see these kinds of improvements on that level, that maybe in the future there'd be more funding available and state agencies could build on that as well. And maybe it could snowball into something even more uniform and consistent, but we're focusing on um, federal land management agencies and the, the mapping tools that they make available right now. Joel, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I will. And that's a good explanation. And I'll just, I'll add to that. And this is actually what I was going to say anyway, but one of the things this this also does is, I mean, there's some specific things in this bill that it would require, but I think it also helps change how the agencies think about their digital information. And oftentimes in the past, or maybe even today, when they actually develop an information layer, they aren't always thinking about recreational access. And so they go through all this work to put together information that's really not that useful to us from a recreation perspective. And it's like, man, you've made these decisions and these rules about access, you've created these opportunities, and then you've gone through this effort to put together this, this information in a digital form. But because you're not thinking about recreational access, it's of no value to me. And so we're really trying to change the paradigm too. And so while this bill won't do everything, I think it's easy to like put together a laundry list of all the stuff you wanna see changed it really starts to move the ball in that direction. And I think it helps, it'll help sort of things snowball that way. So in the future, um, there'll be more that's done here. And, and, and as Jen pointed out, this won't, you know, address like Alaska state lands. They'll, that would be a separate process, but this is one piece of the puzzle. And, and the more we can continue to help sort of move things in this, this direction, the more, the more progress we'll be able to make across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Michelle, I'll connect with you offline because we'd love to keep in touch about this. And I think um, the folks who you represent in that community are um, potentially really um, would definitely benefit from the legislation. And um, maybe we can work on some use cases together, too. So I'll follow up with you. Thanks for those great questions. Yeah, thanks, Jen. It was good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you, too. I hope we'll connect back in Juno. Um, so we want to, I'm going to turn it back over to Joel and he can talk about where exactly um, the bill is in the legislative process and what we're expecting to see over the coming months. Yeah, thank you, Jen. You can just go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Uh, um, after the jail. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I mean, as everybody knows, like 2020 is definitely not normal. And, um, you know, this slide really lays out your normal legislative process. Um, we're hoping to get this bill done before the end of the year. And if that's going to happen, it'll, it'll likely follow an unconventional process, like a lot of things have recently. Um, but so this bill, the, the Modernizing Access to Our Public Land Act was introduced in both the House and the Senate back in March. Um, we had a, a hearing actually in the Senate um, Energy and Natural Resources Committee just in September on the, the 16th. And um, the federal land management agencies were generally pretty positive in, in their testimony. And we actually have a call tomorrow with uh, Senator Murkowski's um, staff and the committee to talk about next steps. In the House side, we're currently working to try and get a hearing scheduled. As you all know, there's an election in less than a month. Um, things are, you know, it's just election season, plus there's other stuff going on given COVID. And so it's, 
um, things are a little bit wild and unpredictable, but what we're really hoping is that um, we can get a markup in the Senate. And so they actually consider the bill and, and make a few adjustments to make it better, hopefully. And, and that, and we get a hearing in the house. And at that point, it's gone through enough process where it's vetted to a point where if there's an opportunity at the end of the year, it could be included in part, some sort of larger negotiated package after the election. And so that's really our hope. Um, I know that the, the federal budget, um, so the, the fiscal year for the, the federal government starts on October 1st and they passed, uh, what they call a continuing resolution, which funds the government. Um, and I believe that current one runs out on December 11th. And so they're going to have to pass another budget in December. And so we're hopeful that it could potentially be part of a larger sort of budgeting package and be included in that then. But, um, some of it, a lot of this is out of our control. And so we're just trying to get it, move it through the process. Um, and so that if the stars align, we're in a good position there. Next slide, please. And, you know, this bill's got good bipartisan support on the Senate side. Um, so Martha McSally is the sponsor and Angus King's the original co-sponsor. Angus King caucuses with the Dems. And so um, good sort of bipartisan introduction. And there's also um, four additional Senate co-sponsors. So senators, Danes from Montana, Manchin from West Virginia, and he also is the ranking member on the committee, um, Collins from Maine, and then Rish from Idaho. And then on the House side, Russ Fulcher from Idaho is the original sponsor, um, with Kilmer being the, the co-sponsor. And uh, also um, there are three other co-sponsors, um, Debbie Dingle, and then Case and Silver. I forget where Case and Silver's are from, but Dingle's a D, Case is a D, and Silver's is a Republican. So we've got good bipartisan support here. And um, obviously with Senator Murkowski being, um, you know, running the committee in Senate Energy and Natural Resources, she and her staff are really key in seeing this passed. So next slide, please. And so I guess in terms of uh, something that folks agree that this is a good idea, we would love your support. And I mean, there's one way you can do it is to go to trcp.org slash mapland. And you can actually click on that link and, and send a, uh, an email to your congressional delegation, um, letting them know you support this. I think even more powerful, you know, if you represent a group or a business that, um, has a relationship with Murkowski's office, communicating that support to her office would be great. Um, Cause like I said, she's a real gatekeeper on this stuff in the Senate and um, she's hearing from her constituents uh, that matters. And so um, that's a great thing. And then also um, there's another thing too on the slides here. Um, I don't know if it, are you, Sorry, I think I just messed it up when I went to the... Uh, oh, you're okay. Me. This is something that's kind of neat um, that we've partnered with Onyx on is... I'm clicking over to it now, Joel. Okay. They have a you know report a land access opportunity page. And so they've actually got a, um, a website that enables the public to report... Um, access opportunities. So if you see a place where access is restricted or limited, and, and then what I mean by that is you can't really get there. It's not that it's open to one vehicle type versus another. It's more about, well, I can't cross this land to get to this land or there's something going on and there's an opportunity to open it up. Um, they've actually got a, a website portal there where you can report that stuff, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of neat. And, uh, and then also, um, you know, you're always welcome to sign up with TRCP too, at, just on our website. But I think if you take action on Mapland as an individual, um, you'll have the option to do that through that. And so that's, that's what I'd recommend, but we certainly love your support on this bill. And so if you, um, you know, if you could take action as an individual or if you work for an entity that would be willing to reach out to Murkowski's staff, we'd, we'd greatly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. So that concludes our presentation. I think we have a couple of extra minutes and we're happy to take more questions. Um, like Joel said, uh, we'd love your support in asking Alaska's congressional delegation to co-sponsor Mapland. And if you um, join us online, then we can help keep you in the loop with updates about this. But happy to take any questions. Our emails are also there at the bottom. Feel free to shoot me a note with any um, questions that you have about the work that we're doing in Alaska. And always happy to connect and look forward to talking with more folks one on one. Um, I'll give folks another second to ask questions, but um, while they're thinking of those, um, I just want to say thank you, Jen and Joel. Um, I, uh, I kind of geek out on this sort of stuff um, and uh, with so much, um, so many challenges, um, accessing accurate um, map data for Colorado from everything from outdoor recreation to recreation planning and on and on. Um, I'm pretty stoked on this measure um, and hope others will be as well. Um, I do want to let um, those of us, the, everyone in the panel, in the um, session today know that next Wednesday, um, please join us when our host Christina Grande <clears throat> leads a conversation reimagining Alaska's outdoors on two wheels in a session we're calling Bikes Belong. Um, and the Reimagining Alaska's Outdoors is a theme for the upcoming fifth annual Confluence um, Summit on the Outdoor Economy, which will be on Zoom October 27th to 29th. Our peren perennially popular public land managers panel follows a welcome by Senator Murkowski. Um, other topics include um, tourism, outdoors as prescription for mental health, making Alaska more walk and bike friendly, um, and national and state policy proposals and priorities like this one. Mm -hmm. um, the conference will be structured for maximum participation in an online environment and priced so that cost isn't a barrier and proceeds benefit um, the, on the ongoing so uh, work of Alaska Outdoor Alliance. So you can find information about the, con uh, the conference, the speakers, and agenda specifics at alaskaoutdooralliance.org. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so again, thank you all for participating. I hope you make our Lunch and Learns a regular part of your Wednesdays. Um, join us at Confluence. Thanks again, Jen and Joel. And we will let everyone get on with their days. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us, Lee.